My name is Michael Levitt, and uh, I'm the president and CEO of the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, one of your hosts this evening. Welcome to tonight's program, Intergenerational Trauma, the Everlasting Impact of the Holocaust, presented with Jax Toronto, featuring Marsha Lederman. As we move further and further away from the Holocaust, we recognize the impact it still has on us uh, today, generations later. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. While we meet today on a virtual platform, please take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our bodies and our souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands and territories of all the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who call this land home. Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center is inspired by the legacy of Simon Wiesenthal. And FSWC works to build a more inclusive, respectful Canada by sharing the lessons of the Holocaust, advocating for human rights, and combating anti-Semitism and hate in all of its forms. Tonight, we are so lucky to be joined by Courage to Change, a division of Jacks Toronto that offers mental health and addiction programming, including educational workshops, customized psychoeducation, and individually tailored support groups. They are all designed to help improve mental health and reduce unhealthy coping. I would like to introduce Jenna Quint, coordinator for the Courage to Change program, who works with other members of the clinical team to help improve mental health and wellness, and wellness on university campuses across Toronto and Canada. Jenna hosts Mental Health Weekends and provides counseling help to students in need of further support. Jenna graduated with a Bachelor of Arts from Western University and a Master of Social Work from Wurzweiler School of Social Work. She was formally placed on the CMHA crisis team where she attended live mental health police calls alongside the Peel Regional Police. She comes to Jack's with almost a decade of digital marketing and healthy strategy experience, but decided to make a career change in 2019 as part of her own journey with mental health. I would ask you all to please give a big virtual welcome to Jenna Quint. Thank you, Jenna. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. And um, I'll get started presenting if you just give me a second. So we're here today talking about intergenerational trauma. Um, if some of you have seen our last, you know, the last presentation, some of this will be repeated for you, but feel free if anybody has any questions to add questions into the chat. At the end of the presentation, we'll address all of the questions, both uh, Marsha and I, depending on what comes up. So anything that comes up as we're speaking, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, okay. So we'll start really simply with what is intergenerational trauma. So intergenerational trauma is the theory that trauma experienced by one person in a family can be passed down to future generations. Um, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Trauma experienced by one person um, earlier in the lineage um, will be re-experienced by other people. So what are some signs of intergenerational trauma? How might you know if you might be experiencing it? So one of the key signs that comes up a lot in the literature is over-identification with parents. So we call this enmeshment or codependency. It's when you feel a really strong connection with your parents, you're sort of afraid to leave them, you're afraid to forge a separate life, your identity is very fused with their identity, and this is something that can come out of intergenerational trauma and survivorship. I'm impaired self-esteem, so feeling like you're not enough and this comes from particularly at tragedies like the Holocaust, where your culture and identity is demonized. Um, so anxiety, hypervigilance, dysphoria, catastrophizing, and guilt. So, um, you know, this is a lot of Jewish tropes, even um, with the catastrophizing. Um, but really, it's uh, about always feeling like the other shoe is going to drop, which Marsha talks about, actually, in her book. Um, always feeling like something bad is going to happen. Always feeling like um, there will tr tragedy will befall you and situations will um, turn out negatively. Like things that should be small things feel much bigger than they are. So these kinds of feelings are common with intergenerational trauma. Um, we have difficulties in interpersonal functioning. So this comes up a lot in the literature. And this can also be intergenerational trauma being expressed. And so 
Um, what this is, is you struggle with relationships, you struggle with attachment. Um, so unexplained maladaptive coping. So addiction is an example. And we'll talk a little bit more about that connection in a coming slide or um, self-harming based behaviors or things like that. And then risky behavior. So addiction also falls into this. Um, but other things can be like loving to go on a motorcycle or adventure travel. I, I know that I certainly have some of that that comes up for me as part of my intergenerational trauma. So intergenerational trauma and addiction, the connection. So I work for JAX, which is Jewish Addiction Community Services. And so um, it is important that we establish the link or connection there. And basically all the evidence points to the fact that intergenerational trauma and addiction are very commonly linked. A lot of the research coming out of um, the indigenous communities and how they've been affected by intergenerational trauma demonstrates a very clear link between addiction and um, the experience of inherited trauma. Um, so there is a strong connection um, and a link. Basically, you may be experiencing a lot of trauma or um, feelings that you don't know how to cope with, and addiction can be a form of coping that isn't necessarily adaptive over the long run, but helps you regulate your nervous system in the short run. So now I'll share a little bit about uh, my story, how I came to be doing this work. So um, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. She survived um, the Kovna ghetto and uh, later deportation to um, concentration camps. Uh, she uh, then immigrated to South Africa where um, she raised my father. Um, so, you know, this Holocaust legacy, we'd always spoken about it in my family um, very briefly in the way of like, your grandmother was in the Holocaust. Some of our Jewish um, identity was enforced by this. So we had to go to prayers or I had to go to Hebrew school because it was important to maintain Jewish identity because of the Holocaust. But outside of that, we had never really spoken about it. And so as long as I, you know, I can remember and even reports from before I can remember, um, I've had this sort of unhappiness. It was almost like a dark cloak that sat on top of my being. It wasn't exactly who I was, but it felt like part of me because I didn't really know life without it. Like even as a baby, you know, I cried all the time. I cried more than most uh, babies. I was described as colicky. Um, you know, my aunt once made an offhanded comment that, you know, watching me was seriously stressful because um, I never sleep slept and I always cried. And this feeling of unhappiness that was present even from being a baby, it followed me throughout life and I struggled with my mental health. Um, you know, I was able to graduate from university. I started to build a successful career in pharmaceuticals. I did all the things that I was supposed to be doing, um, but none of it was really making me happy. I sought out a lot of different mental health help over the years and was diagnosed with a variety of different things from PDD to GAD. I saw psychiatrists, I saw psychologists, I saw whomever I could to try to seek help through um, Western means, and none of it really helped. Because all of these diagnoses I got, you know, all the acronyms and the letters, they didn't really describe what I was feeling. And all of the feelings that I was having didn't really match up to my life circumstances. I had two loving parents um, who were supportive. I had a family. I had friends. Um, I had all the things that were supposed to make you happy, that were supposed to be protective. But yet I carried around this baggage of unhappiness is the only way that I can really describe it. And so... Over the course of many years, um, like uh, Michael was saying in the beginning, about 10 years, I um, was working in uh, marketing, uh, digital marketing, and I figured that once I got a particular job as a strategist, I would finally be happy. So I worked uh, my butt off and finally got this job as a strategist. Um, and then I found that I was more unhappy than ever doing this work and that the work was not the solution to my problems. So at this point, um, after almost two years in that job. Um, and by the way, the job had, the place had a lovely culture. I was very close with all the members of the team. So it was none of really that. Um, I was just unhappy. And so after about two years of doing this job, I uh, decided to quit and travel across Asia trying to figure out what was going on. Um, so at this time I did my yoga teacher training. I um, engaged in meditation, in a 10 day silent meditation. I tried a variety of different energy work, sought out different kinds of teachers. Um, and yoga somewhat helped, um, breath work somewhat helped, but at the end of the day, I was still sort of plagued by this, um, uh, persistent unhappiness. My family and I used to always joke and call it chronic dissatisfaction syndrome because we had no proper word for it. Um, so anyways, I returned back from Asia, um, 
I needed money, quite honestly. So I went back into marketing um, and tried to make it work, but it just wasn't working. And this concept of intergenerational trauma, it kept popping up for me in different places, but I kept kind of dismissing it because it seemed like hokum. Like how could something that never happened in my life affect me and my functioning to this day? You know, like it never felt like that Holocaust trauma was my trauma. It felt like somebody else's trauma because in a sense it was. Um, that was underscored by the fact that we never really discussed the Holocaust or my grandmother's Holocaust legacy in our house. It was sort of unspoken. It wasn't taboo. You could bring it up, but nobody really talked about it or um, wanted to explore it. It was almost like my family wanted to leave it behind us and move forward. We had moved to another two other countries since, um, you know, we were trying to build a legacy here. And the idea of focusing on the Holocaust in our family, it just wasn't really something that we did. Um, and this wasn't really something that I questioned, to be honest. So as I said, um, this concept of the Holo of intergenerational trauma kept coming up, coming up, coming up. And eventually after the fourth or fifth time, I can't actually remember how many times, um, it started to kind of come across my path. I started to do some research. And I started to wonder to myself, what is the science here? Is there any evidence that supports the existence of intergenerational trauma? Is this really a thing? Um, and as I started to read more about it, both from an Eastern and Western perspective, I started to discover that there was actually a lot of preliminary evidence pointing to the fact that intergenerational trauma is very much real and it very much affects our um, psychological functioning. Okay. So now I'm gonna go into a little bit of the background research. So, um, sort of what are the studies that underpin this or point to this. So one thing I really wanna highlight before I go deeper into the research is that this is a very new field of research. There's a lot of promise in the research, but it is very new. And so some of the insights we don't wanna take as fact, but rather as theory um, pointing us towards further scientific exploration to confirm as fact. So some findings that came from animal studies. Firstly, the effects um, of a break in the mother-child bond can be observed for three generations. So they've done multiple studies with mice who were separated from their mothers or prevented from breastfeeding with their mothers. And this uh, was done on more than one occasion. Some of the separations were longer, some were shorter. Um, but what they saw in response to these uh, separations, even brief separations, was genetic and behavioral changes in the offspring of the mice who were separated from their mothers. And these changes didn't stop at that offspring. They were actually transmitted to, um, to, uh, to future offspring for up to three generations. So even a brief separation, even a brief break in that mother-child bond could cause pervasive lasting effects that could be transmitted for many generations. Now think about how severe that break in that mother-child bond would be in the case of some kind of a global national tra a tragedy like the Holocaust or the residential school systems where families are ripped apart and you may never see your mother again or you, for many of your formative years, you may not be properly parented by a loving mother. Um, and so this one, number two, I find this super fascinating. Um, it's basically studies on a study on mice that has shown that traumatic memories can actually be passed uh, down for once again up to three generations. And so what this study really did was it took mice and exposed them to a very unique smell, the smell of cherry blossoms, and they shocked the mice whenever they were exposed to this smell, creating a fear response. Then they let the mice have offspring, and then they exposed those offspring to that same exact unique smell without um, the stimulus or the, like that created the fear response. And what they found was the children of those mice reacted with the same level of fear or the same kind of fear as the parents in response to this stimulus without ever having been exposed to the shocks themselves. And this continued for up to three generations um, despite the fact that they weren't exposed to shocks. So this is super fascinating and we can see some evidence of this or evidence is maybe the wrong word, but we can see some examples in our own life of this. For example, many of us have an inborn fear of snakes or spiders, despite the fact that we may never have had a negative experience with a snake or spider. And so some of these are almost like tra uh, traumas or fear responses that are passed down through the generations because they're adaptive. And so, you know, passing down uh, a fear-based memory through the generations can be adaptive, assuming that, um, you know, a child is raised in the same environment as their parents. 
it's much less adaptive when the world changes so quickly, for example, the world we live in now, and um, we are being raised in a completely different uh, environment than maybe some of our grandparents or parents. So now I'm just going to talk about the the first studies um, of intergenerational trauma. It was Vivian M. Rakoff. Um, so he was a Canadian psychiatrist at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, which is now CAMH. And he was one of the first people to study intergenerational trauma. So he was working with survivors and their kids. And what he noticed was that survivors, uh, that the children of survivors actually displayed really high rates of psychological distress, higher than, uh, the, uh, than um, the children of people who didn't who weren't survivors, uh, but had similar genetic backgrounds. So they published some qualitative reports that detailed these observations. Uh, the problem with these was that they were qualitative and based on a small number of case studies, so they were widely criticized. Um, but uh, what did happen was in response to these studies, there was a lot of research uh, that started coming into bear in the 1970s on this topic. So another really interesting uh, thing that I find, especially uh, because I work with trauma and addictions myself, um, is that um, post-traumatic growth, which is PTG, um, people who are the children of survivors, uh, and the research on this is mixed, but two different studies uh, found um, that the children of survivors may grow less in response to their own trauma, and may experience PTSD at much higher rates. So basically when a trauma occurs, there's three kinds of things that can happen. Uh, and this is a little simplified, but for the sake of now I'll simplify. Um, you can respond to the trauma by developing PTSD-like symptoms or stuck points and getting really stuck in the trauma and arrested by the trauma. Um, you cannot react to the trauma, it cannot change anything, which is very unlikely and I have yet to really see or you can uh, respond with post-traumatic growth, meaning um, you know, sentences like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger are examples of people who might've responded to a trauma with post-traumatic growth. So it's by looking at that trauma, processing that trauma, learning from that trauma and growing from that trauma. So what they've actually found um, with mixed results um, is that um, veterans from the Yom Kippur War had less uh, tra uh, post-traumatic growth if their parents were Holocaust survivors when compared to people of similar backgrounds whose parents weren't survivors. And the same thing was replicated with veterans from the Lebanon War, um, or not the same thing was replicated, but they're more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder if their parents were Holocaust survivors. So what we're really seeing is that inherited trauma can actually make it more difficult for us to grow from a trauma that we experience in our own life and it's more likely to impair our own functioning which I think is pretty significant. So there's a lot of other findings too. So uh, a large body of research has found low cortisol levels which is the stress hormone and in atypically high rates of anxiety and depression and PTSD in Holocaust survivors and their kids. So what does this mean? That um, inherited trauma may actually change the way that um, our hormones, uh, in our stress hormones in our body um, are delivered, making us more likely to be very reactive to stress, um, meaning higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of mental health issues, et cetera. And so what about other groups? Um, so researchers have found similar results um, when exploring the effects on people from the Holodomor in Ukraine, the Khmer Rouge killings in Cambodia, the Rwandan genocide, um, the replacement of uh, the displacement of indigenous people, and the enslavement of African Americans. So across a lot of different communities that have experienced trauma, uh, we are seeing uh, similar evidence um, of intergenerational trauma and the significant effects that it has. So now I'll talk a little bit about how it's passed down. I'm gonna talk about epigenetics and learned behaviors in families. Uh, one thing I'm gonna put out there with epigenetics, I'm not a geneticist, I just share high level information. If anyone wants more detailed up information about epigenetics, they can reach out to me afterwards and I can connect you with um, a true expert. So what is epigenetics? Basically, it's the study of how it, um, behaviors and environments can cause changes that affect the way your genes are expressed. So one thing to really note about epigenetics that is important, epigenetic changes are reversible. Um, they don't change your genes or DNA, but they change how your body reads the DNA sequence and expresses a particular trait. So basically epigenetics sits on top of your genes and functions almost as extra instructions that turn on and off the expression of certain genes. Um, those instructions can be changed or rewritten, so to speak, um, but it can be very difficult to do so. 
Um, so transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, what that means is it's the transmission of epigenetic markers from one parent to child, and it may affect how our traits um, are expressed without actually altering our DNA. So now we're going to take a step back just to kind of further explain the concept in case it's a little bit confusing because epigenetics can be tricky to grasp. So, um, you know, many of you may know, some of you may not, the DNA carries all of the information about your physical characteristics. And all of uh, your physical characteristics are essentially determined by proteins. Um, each protein is encoded by a particular gene, which means like a small section or sequence of the DNA that specifies how a single protein is to be made from a sequence of amino acids. So your genes contain instructions for creating proteins, right? Um, genes only make up about 1% of our DNA, which I think is very interesting. The rest of your DNA is actually um, epigenetic material that regulates when, how, and how much a protein is made. And this is what we call gene expression. Epigenetics, like I said, sit on top of genes like extra instructions and help determine a gene expression by turning on and off genes. So certain genes may or may not uh, be working or expressed depending on the instructions provided by uh, the epigenetic material that sits on top of those genes. So maybe this is a little bit confusing. So I just wanted to give a quick hot example that might be helpful. So cell differentiation. So every single cell in your body contains all of the same DNA, but they function very differently. A muscle cell and a liver cell certainly do not hold the same functions and are not necessarily alike. But how does you know two different cells with the exact same DNA come out to be so different? That's through epigenetics. So epigenetics instruct your cells on what to become, whether it's a muscle cell or a liver cell or a skin cell, et cetera. Um, so you can see how much effect epigenetics really do have on our functioning. Um, yeah. So how would this really work for inherited trauma? So epigenetic markers might regulate the genes that build the brain systems and hormones that regulate stress. So cortisol and the HPA access, making someone more reactive to stress. So there are certain brain regions um, that moderate stress. And if um, certain epigenetic markers are present, we might have a brain that's much more reactive to stress. We might also have um, different levels of stress hormones in our blood, meaning that um, we end up feeling a lot more stressed or reactive to smaller stimuli that wouldn't necessarily um, cause somebody else to react. It's basically like being in fight or flight, so to speak, or perceiving threats everywhere. Um, so these epigenetic markers can uh, develop in response to trauma, and they can be passed down potentially uh, transgenerationally. So environmental stress can turn on these inherited epigenetic markers, uh, predisposing someone to mental health issues. So meaning if there's a, a scary stimulus in your environment that's somewhat similar to what your parents may have experienced, if you inherited that epigenetic marker, that stimulus might actually turn that marker on causing um, the amount of stress hormones or the way that your brain is wired to uh, be a little bit different and more attuned to being in a very stressful environment. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about behavioral inheritance of trauma. And everyone really likes epigenetics and epigenetics can be really comforting, um, but behavioral inheritance of trauma and these theories, um, there is more evidence and more weight to them. And what this really means is this is learned behaviors in families. So issues that might come from having a traumatized mother and how that might affect the whole family system in a negative way and how that break in the mother-child bond, which we talked about a little bit earlier, um, that might be actually passed down through the generations. Um, so basically the early theories rejected the idea that genetically inherited, uh, that um, trauma could be genetically inherited. And they focused on the idea that our trauma survivors externalize their symptoms. Um, so what that really means is that the symptoms of the trauma were present in the family and were inherited by the children. Um, so what does this really relate to? Family dynamics, social psychology, learning theory, et cetera. So basically there might be maladaptive dynamics in the family. Um, there might be uh, issues with socializing and forming bonds and how we learn. So trauma survivors often suffer from mental illness, most commonly PTSD. 
almost 10% of people affected by trauma suffer from PTSD. Um, many studies have, uh, or several studies more so, have documented unhealthy family functioning with people who suffer from PTSD. And this can be in areas like effective responsiveness, meaning responding to the emotion of your infant, which is huge, um, how you solve problems within the family, uh, including conflict, how cohesive and together the family is, uh, how you are in your relationship or how you adjust in your marriage, and um, how you treat your children. Like uh, you may treat them um, with less love and care because the PTSD symptoms get in the way of forming that secure bond. So um, many people have focused on attachment theory and have noticed attachment type can be inherited. So um, there's a large body of evidence and many therapies based on the fact that secure attachment is important for healthy psychological functioning. And what that means is having the kind of a trusting relationship with your primary caregiver where you will seek independence, but also seek care from that caregiver when you feel like you need extra care. Um, there's other types of uh, insecure attachments that uh, may develop if you don't uh, develop this proper bond with your mother. And I won't go into all of that just because we don't have the time, but it is very interesting. And so what the research shows is that um, basically people who experience a severe trauma they struggle to form secure attachments with their infants. And that makes sense because if you don't have emotional attunement, meaning you're not like, or effective responsiveness, we'll call it, um, meaning you're not responding properly to your infant's emotions and reactions, then you're not going to create a secure bond. Um, and so what ends up happening is you create this insecure attachment, which has a host of psychological and interpersonal functioning issues associated with it. And that insecure attachment is basically passed down through the generations for many generations until um, somebody does the work of healing it. And so this can create a lot of dysfunction within uh, families and also within the lives of people affected. Whoop. Sorry. So now we'll talk um, a little bit about four coping styles among uh, Holocaust survivor families. So this is some research done by a clinician named Jael Danielli. She's fabulous. She does a lot of really interesting work. And she did a lot of work with uh, Holocaust survivors and their families and children. And so what she noted from her work was that there's four basic styles, and they're not exactly cut and dry, but they are interesting, um, that tends to occur among survivor families. And so these are reactions, uh, emotional reactions that Im impact family functioning. So the first style we have is victim families. So what does this look like? Pervasive depression, worry, mistrust, and fear of the outside world. There is a lot of enmeshment and clinging within the family, a lot of guilt tripping. And then there's a lot of catastrophizing. So small changes in the everyday environment can cause catastrophic reactions that don't seem to fit with the environment. So how does this really affect uh, the family system? Um, there's extreme guilt and mistrust of outsiders. Um, enmeshment issues, issues forming relationships, and a fear of having children. Um, these kids tend to be driven to success or sabot or self-sabotage, so they go either way, so over-ambition or they keep themselves small, and this oversensitivity to the needs of others or like an advanced conscience. Um, then we have fighter families. So fighter families have this intense drive to build and achieve, so they really want to create something, there's compulsive activity, there's no stopping in the home, and any behavior that looks like uh, victimization, weakness, or self-pity is not permitted. Um, there's a lot of pride in these families, and relaxation is considered superfluous. We There's no relaxation to be had. Um, and so how does this look to the children, or how do the children in these families look? They have a mistrust um, for authority figures, and they fight against them often. Um, this either presents with enmeshment um, with uh, the parents or an over-independence where they want nothing, kind of nothing to do with their family. They want to get as far away from them as possible. Um, there's issues with delegation and a contempt for dependency, creating issues forming relationships and a tendency to seek out dangerous situations. And so one thing I'll note that Daniele notes is that um, the different styles may be associated with different experiences in the Holocaust. For example, the victim families may have um, been in the camps whereas the fighter families may have been uh, more part of the resistance. Uh, we have numb families. So there's this pervasive silence and depletion of all emotions in the home. Um, parents are capable of tolerating only a minimal amount of stimulation, whether pleasurable or painful. So it's sort of like 
a quiet zone. How does this affect members of the family system? Uh, there's a reduced inner emotional world, limited emotional contact and expressions of self numbing. So they don't, they're not very in touch with their emotions, which makes sense since that wasn't modeled in childhood. They appear less capable and intelligent than in reality or may. Uh, there's also a lot of anger that they hold and a sense of detachment, um, even if they're socially accepted. And they often marry people who provide the parental love that they were denied. Then we have the we made it family. So these families have the single-minded pursuit of success. So they're very into higher education, social and political status, fame, and wealth. Um, they use their money primarily for the uh, benefit of their children. And so what did, the, the, did their children really look like? Their children are highly assimilated into society. Um, they experience a lot of numbing isolation. They might experience a lot of somatic symptoms, so like unpleasant feelings in the body. Um, you know, the children may be neglected in pursuit of goals, and they're often sheltered from the consequences of their actions using their parents' money. So now we'll just talk a little bit about healing inherited trauma. So the Aboriginal Healing Foundation had, um, you know, did a comprehensive report on inherited trauma, and they talked about three important pillars for healing this kind of trauma. Uh, the first one is reclaiming history. So raising awareness by uh, having survivors share details of their events or having people affected share details of their events, of the events. And this is what uh, Marsha is going to do um, later. It's going to kind of talk about her family story because it's really important that we share these stories of these of our families, of what happened. It's really important that we have these conversations about the Holocaust. It's really important that we don't lean into what Yael Daniele calls the conspiracy of silence, where we don't talk about the Holocaust or the effects that it may have. Um, yeah, when we reclaim history, it really allows us to better understand our um, family trauma responses and generational patterns. So certain things that I've had people reach out to me um, after this presentation and talk about is like a pervasive feeling of sadness or loneliness or being alone that doesn't match their life circumstances. They may have a family, they may have many close friends, they may be part of a community in a big way, but yet they still feel very alone. And um, when they start to understand their parents' um, Holocaust legacy or whatever their trauma legacy is, they start to understand that this feeling might have been inherited from that pervasive loneliness that comes from losing your entire family. Um, then we have cultural interventions. So connecting with ancestral traditions, as many had been lost during the course of trauma. So getting closer to your Judaism, if that speaks to you. And then there's therapeutic healing. So traditional and religious therapies, both Western and non-cultural therapies, and they can be used alone and in combination with each other. So some of those Western modalities that I was mentioning, I'm not going to go into too many details about them, but if you're curious about them, uh, you can email me after. I just don't have the time. Um, so internal family systems is important, is an important one that was very helpful for me. So um, IFS uh, is a type of therapy that involves working with different parts of yourself. And there's one part um, that in more advanced IFS, you can start to work with called legacy burdens. And legacy burdens are traumas that are cultural or um, given to you by your family, um, and they're not actually yours to hold. And you can work with these legacy burdens in order to release the pain that you're carrying through this legacy burden and integrate that legacy burden um, better into your functioning. Um, and there's family constellations. Uh, it's a type of therapy that um, uses some Zulu kind of African healing alongside uh, Western therapeutic modalities in order to kind of deal with family trauma. It deals with the whole family unit. And then there's the core language approach, um, which uh, basically uses language or specific words in order to try to figure out what the source of somebody's trauma may be and heal that trauma. So for example, um, and I warn you, this is uh, could be a little bit triggering, but um, the author of the core language approach Mark Woolen, he talks about um, how he worked with one person who um, she was highly suicidal and the word vaporize kept coming up. And then it turned out that she had an unknown Holocaust um, grandparent that was part of her legacy. And by discovering that and working through that trauma, they were actually able to heal her. So any of these approaches alongside a bunch of others that um, I can mention if you want to email me um, can be helpful in doing some of this healing work. 
So I'll just uh, end here by talking about what's helped me. So um, education on intergenerational trauma, so learning all this stuff, doing this research has been hugely helpful for me, just invalidating even like what I was experiencing. Um, discussing intergenerational trauma with other people. So workshops like this, they're really healing for me. Um, learning more about the Holocaust and the stories around the Holocaust. Um, discussing with my family our traumas and how they may have affected our family systems. We've only somewhat done this, but um, as we start to do it more, I feel like it will be more and more healing. And then for me, self-work with IFS. So I did a lot of um, work with IFS on myself where I worked with a lot of my legacy burdens and was able to release some of the pain of them and even understand where they were coming from and what the root was. You can see that's what affected them. Okay. So three takeaways um, from the presentation just to kind of sum it all up. So trauma experienced by one generation can be transmitted to the next generation. Uh, influencing physical and psychological health. Um, inherited trauma is likely transmitted through both epigenetics and learned behaviors. And you can see how they might work together, of course, right? Epigenetics predispose us to a certain response triggered by the environment and learned behaviors or environmental influences in our family can then trigger those epigenetic responses and then they sort of work together in tandem. Um, and then healing involves reclaiming history, connecting with culture, and therapeutic interventions. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, introduce uh, Marsha Liederman, um, who is the author of Kiss the Dares. I read her book, of course, and I absolutely loved it. I found um, that I connected with a lot of her story, even though she's a G2 and I'm a G3, uh, meaning my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor and her parents were directly survivors. I still found that a lot of her story had a lot of, I'd really recommend uh, reading the book if you connect with this topic. Um, sorry, my... Sorry, I'm having some internet issues. Hello. Hi, you're really good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I just didn't speak up. Okay. Sorry. I'll just it's Marcia now. Um, so they didn't find out. Huh? Um, sorry, if anybody has their mic still on, would you guys mind muting? I will. Here we go. So like I said, uh, Marsha Lederman is the author of Kiss the Red Stairs, The Holocaust Once Removed, and she's also a columnist for The Globe and Mail. She joined The Globe in uh, 2007 and spent 15 years as its Western arts correspondent. Uh, before joining The Globe, she had a variety of positions with CBC Radio, including National Arts Reporter. She has also worked in commercial radio and hosted her own talk show. She's won several journalism awards, including the 2019 National Newspaper Award for Arts and Entertainment Reporting. Her memoir was published by McClellan and Stewart in May, and it was an, in, an instant national bestseller. Born and raised in Toronto, she's lived in Vancouver since 2007. So let's welcome Marcia. Hi, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. And it was so interesting to listen to that presentation. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, she's been following me around. She knows exactly what's going on in my head. Oh no. Um, but oh gosh, so much re resonated there, Jenna. So thank you for that. And even though I've been completely immersed in intergenerational trauma for the last few years, well, for my whole life, but really for the last few years as I was writing this book, I just, I learned more listening to you. So thank you for that. Great. Yeah. And like I said, I really connected with uh, your story too. So all the messed up <laughs> descendants <laughs> can relate to one another, but that helps. It helps to have community, right? 100%. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your book, your story, uh, just for anyone who may not have had the opportunity to read it yet? 
Sure, of course. So um, this is the book. It's called Kiss the Red Stairs, The Holocaust Once Removed. And sorry, the lighting is a bit odd here, but uh, the woman pictured on the front cover is was my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Rachel Lindzen, who I never met. I never met any of my grandparents because all of my grandparents were murdered at Treblinka. Um, my parents were survivors. They were both Polish Jews. They're not alive anymore. Um, but uh, just very briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about their stories. My father uh, was born in Ludz, Poland in 1919. He was 19 when the Nazis invaded Poland. He ended up in the ghetto at Pietrkov Trebinelski, and there he was a worker. Um, worker. He was a slave laborer. Uh, and he there was literally about to be executed when he bribed a Nazi guard, managed to escape, got false papers identifying him mm -hmm. as a Polish Catholic uh, with a different name. He used those papers to escape into Germany, a fact that always sort of um, it lit my imagination up when I was a kid. I thought that was such an interesting twist on it all um, because these were stories. They were like adventure stories I was hearing. And uh, in Germany, he got work on a farm pretending to be this Polish Catholic named Tadek Rudnicki. And he was there from some point in 1942 until 1945, the end of the war. Um, my mother had a different story and a different experience. She was born in Radom, Poland. She was 14 when the Nazis invaded. At 15, she was taken off the streets of the ghetto by a Nazi guard and forced to come help set up barracks that the Nazi guards were going to be living in and forced to live there with them. Uh, along with uh, six other young teenage Jewish girls slash women. They were, 13 was the youngest, and a, a couple of older women as well. Um, it was horrible, but it saved her life, because when the ghetto was liquidated, she was saved. She was in those barracks. After that, she was a slave laborer at a munitions factory, and then deported to Auschwitz in August of 1944. She was there for three months. She was very, very ill. But the good thing that happened at Auschwitz, a sentence you don't hear very often, is she was reunited with her sister, who she hadn't seen for years at that point. And as the story goes, my mother had just arrived and had her arm tattooed and her head shaved and her sister came up to her and her head had been shaved and they laughed and laughed um, because they, as they used to say, they both looked so ridiculous with their heads shaved. But of course, that wasn't where the laughter came from. I came to understand it was the joy at this very improbable and miraculous reunion. And they were also reunited there with a great, with an aunt, their mother's youngest sister. And the th these three women kept each other alive for the rest of the war. They were um, sent at the same time out of Auschwitz to a satellite camp of Buchenwald, where they were slave laborers in a munitions factory. From there, they were sent on a death march at the end of March 1945. And on April 1st, 1945, which was Easter Sunday and Passover, they were liberated by the U.S. Army. And that was about 60 kilometers from the farm where my father had been hiding in plain sight. And he went, he heard about 700 Jewish women who had been liberated and he went to look for his sister. Uh, his sister, unfortunately, had been murdered, but he met my mom. So that is, um, that's how they met in Germany, in Kaunitz, Germany, they married and they had one child there. And then the three of them moved to Canada in 1951 and had two more children. Um, three girls, my sisters are a fair bit older than I am, 10 and 17 years older. Um, they lived in Toronto. I lived in Tr Toronto in Bathurst Manor, which I imagine quite a few of you would be familiar with. 
and um, they were amazing people. They were, they were survivors in every sense. Unfortunately, my father died uh, quite young. He was 64 and died very suddenly while on a trip. Uh, and I was 18. It was four days after my 18th birthday. So I didn't really know him as an adult. Well, I didn't know him as an adult. My mother uh, died in 2006. And uh, she had a full life. And she was amazing, as was my father. And I miss them very much. And I'm pretty sure what happened to them has had a, a major impact on me, which is why I'm here talking to you tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I connect a lot, even with the story, with what you're saying. But uh, one of the things that comes up through the book um, that I thought was particularly fascinating and I felt a particular connection to was you talking about how you attach to other people and feeling like you struggle to sometimes form those secure attachments or like those proper bonds. And you think that the Holocaust trauma um, or that transgenerational legacy might be part of it. And I really, really uh, connected with that uh, throughout the book as you talked about it. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about that if you're comfortable uh, kind of share Absolutely. with us. Yes. And it, yes, you asked me to talk about the book and I didn't. Uh, so the book is, I mean, it's, there are several streams of it and they're braided together. One stream is what I just told you about my parents' stories um, with a lot more detail than what I just gave you. One stream is my story. Um, what kind of atmosphere I was born into and raised in uh, a home of Holocaust survivors uh, for the, the good and the bad. And then um, what's happening to me in contemporary times as I was writing this book was I was going through a divorce and the divorce acted as, I believe, a triggering episode that um, brought those um, intergenerational issues forward in <laughs> a catastrophic way. And a lot of that, you know, so many of the traits that you mentioned, I have struggled with my whole life. The, the catastrophizing, oh my gosh, I can catastrophize. Like, I, I feel like if there was an award for it, I should win it. Um, I cannot tell you how many missed cell phone calls have meant someone is dead. Um, like truly. And I have been with friends who were um, more normal than me or maybe not Jewish. And they can't believe that I react that way to someone not picking up my call. Um, but it really does happen. Uh, also a great fear, you know, you were talking about interpersonal relationships, really afraid to trust anyone, always expecting the worst, always suspicious, um, not a great atmosphere to have, you know, a healthy relationship. And then um, even when things are going well and they did go well um, for some time for me, uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop and the other shoe dropped. And then I was really triggered. Um, and it was around that time that I started, well, I wasn't sleeping very much. I was doing a lot of doom scrolling at night. And I thought, you know, I wonder, could the Holocaust have something to do with the way I'm reacting to this? Didn't really come out that way, but, you know, people had, um, people, uh, a therapist had asked me about that, about the possible connection. And then a, an important study came out, you refer to it, um, you referred to it, Jenna, uh, Rachel Yehuda study that looked at the descendants of Holocaust survivors, and the impact of the trauma on the children of survivors. And I, I heard about this study, and I, I wanted to read everything I could about the study and about her. And I read an interview with her and she talked about triggering the things that uh, children of survivors had trouble with. And she said any sort of separation, like a divorce, that kind of thing can be, you know, I can't remember her exact words, but that, that could be a real problem. And when I read that, I thought, oh, 
is this me? Is this possibly me? So then I became um, really interested in the science and I read a lot about epigenetics and um, and also the clinical studies that preceded those studies like Vivian Rakoff um, and uh, here in Vancouver, Robert Krell did a lot of this important work. Canada's actually contributed a lot to this area. And so that became another stream, the science um, and the clinical work was an important part of my book. And then also the history. So I was really, um, I'm really angry at myself for not getting the story firsthand from my parents or as much of the story as I should have. There are a lot of gaps, a lot of holes that I was not able to fill. And at this difficult time, I weirdly wanting to, I, I felt like I wanted my parents. I needed unconditional love. I was going through this hard time. Oh, I miss my mom and dad. And what did I do? I thought if I could learn everything that they went through in the, in the Holocaust, that would help me feel closer to them. Very strange, I know, but it did help actually. And I didn't just learn about what happened to them in the Holocaust, but I tried to learn as much as I could about what their lives were like before the Holocaust. And while there were some clues and interviews that my parents had left behind, a lot of this work um, was done by reading contemporary accounts of where they were. So I read about other people's experiences in the Radom ghetto to understand what my mother might have experienced or witnessed. And I read about experiences during her time in Auschwitz etc. And it, you know, it was maybe not comforting, but it certainly provided perspective. You know, I thought things were bad over here. Well, guess what? Your parents went through a lot worse. So those are sort of the, the areas that I braid together in the story. And the other thing, and I, I can't believe I haven't mentioned this, is that I have a son who is now 14 and he is playing, I don't know, Among Us in VR, a couple doors down. Um, and I told him he had to be quiet until I was done. And he, um, you know, my huge concern, my biggest concern was I don't want him burdened the way I have been burdened. I don't want him to catastrophize or not think he can have a happy relationship or a happy life. I want him to be well, to have a happy, successful existence on this planet. So how do I stop this here so it doesn't get to him? So that's also a very important part of the book. Yeah, and I think each generation kind of heals in segments. Like the first generation is too traumatized, perhaps, to do a lot of that <laughs> work and to really even face yeah. up to what happened because it was just so horrific. Then the second generation... I think that there's a lot of still safety concerns and concerns about like position in society, things like that, that are very safety based. And then for, you know, me being a grandchild, we're removed enough from the trauma and from the survivors that um, more of the healing starts, but we couldn't have done some of that healing without, you know, what your generation did of starting to look at those patterns and what kind of might have come out of the Holocaust and uh, those kinds of things. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but. Yeah, and I think a lot of people like me, the the second generation, we were we didn't want to hurt our parents. We were very protective of them. They'd already been through this terrible, terrible thing. We didn't want to make it worse by bringing it up and asking them questions, uh, or at least some people felt that way. And I think the survivors, many of them didn't want to burden their children. And they, you know, maybe not being psychology experts thought if we don't talk about it, our children will not be burdened with the trauma that we experience. So let's just continue on with life. And I think a lot of Holocaust families were like that. Uh, but they do talk to the grandchildren and the grandchildren are able to ask the questions and you get a lot of meaningful dialogue between the survivors and their grandchildren. And that is a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I think also like yeah, Al Daniele mentions it, like the conspiracy of silence that went on following the Holocaust. Cause there was also like, not only did the survivors survive this horrific thing and then often have to immigrate to a new country, start a new life with no family, no friends. There was a lot of stigma to being a survivor too. Like a lot of questions around like, what did you do to survive? 
Um, you know, are you really a good person? Like all of these sorts of questions came up. There was also a lot of fear of outwardly expressing Judaism in response to the fact that being Jewish was uh, so demonized. And anti-Semitism didn't necessarily stop because of the Holocaust. People reflected on it more, but it still existed in a lot of places. So I think uh, at least this is what Danielli describes um, as reasons, um, as well as the burdensomeness of why a lot of the survivors didn't really want to highlight their Jewishness, their experience as survivors, um, why a lot of them just kind of wanted to move forward and try to make something of their lives or whatever it was they were doing. Um, but it was also the societal stigma that people didn't don't necessarily realize now existed after the Holocaust, which I think is sort of sad and interesting at the same time. Yeah, I think for my parents, it was really interesting what I what I experienced was that they were embarrassed, not of being Holocaust survivors, but of being immigrants with accents that who they were not, you know, Canadian born Canadians. They used to talk to me about the Canadian parents of my friends because I was one of the younger children of survivors. My parents were in their 40s when they had me. And they were, you know, it they saw themselves as the term that they used was greeners, which I think, again, a lot of people watching tonight will be familiar with that term. And it was, it was not a compliment. It was um, a form of self-deprecation when they talked about themselves as greeners. And that's just so sad when you think about it now, when a refugee comes to this country, you look at them and you just want to take them in your arms and help them and give them whatever they need so that they can heal and be well and start again. I don't think that was the atmosphere when my parents and other survivors came to Canada. It, some looked upon them with derision um, or just, you know, looked down on them that they were these, you know, these immigrants. And so, well, my parents weren't they were very lucky. They were in a beautiful community of other survivors. Um, you know, all of these survivors had lost all or most of their families and they became families to each other. And that was beautiful. And that's what I was sort of brought up into. So it wasn't, um, there wasn't silence in my house. My parents talked about it, but it was just sort of in bits and pieces and it was always kind of there. And it, I never just sort of sat down and got the whole story from beginning to end, which I regret very much. What do you think your block was? Like, why do you think you never did that until later? I think I was afraid maybe of what I was going to hear. I was afraid to hurt. I mean, this is really my mother because my father, as I say, I was, I was a teenager. I wasn't that interested in his life, which is a terrible thing to admit, but I'm experiencing it now as the mother of a teenager. There's karma for you. He's not that interested in my life either. I promise you. Um, but I, I would say that with my mom, I was afraid to ask the questions. I was afraid to hurt her. And I was probably afraid of what I was going to hear. Uh, there's a story I tell very early in the book when I realized that I don't have grandparents and I ask, or I mean, I never, I knew I didn't have grandparents. I didn't know about grandparents, but I made a friend and she had grandparents. So I asked my mother, why don't I have grandparents? And my mother gave me a very frank answer um, that I have paraphrased. Um, obviously, I don't remember the exact words, but as I recall it, she said to me, your grandparents were Jewish and there was a war and the Germans didn't like Jews and they killed them by putting them into uh, gas showers, making them take gas showers. So, you know, this was a mind blowing answer for me. I'm five and I don't know about Germans. I, who are they? Why don't they like Jews? Do they still not like Jews? And how do these gas showers work? How do they kill you? Does the does gas come out of the spout instead of water? All these things are going through my mind. And I think, you know, subconsciously, the message was, be careful when you ask these kinds of questions. And then yeah. in the end, I was, I did, I was actually, I had booked a trip to go visit my mother in Florida, where she was spending the winter. Um, 
and I had plans to record her story and write it down and uh, I booked the trip and she died that day. So I never got to do it. It's like heartbreaking. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the showers because it's something I've been contemplating a little bit lately as I've been doing more research um, because growing up in my family, and this is partly because my parents are South African, but we always took baths, particularly my dad and myself. We always like stayed away from showers and it's partly cultural, but I started to think about lately, whether in some ways it's like a fear-based memory, the idea of like going in a shower and having it rain down on you. And uh, I much prefer even now, for a while, I didn't have a bathtub and I was showering but the second that my bathtub got fixed and I had it again, now I'm only bathing again. And I find it kind of interesting, like culturally here in Canada, everybody showers, nobody really takes baths, but I find that I'm much more attracted to that. And I've wondered about that even as a trauma response myself, because I remember learning about the gas showers and thinking while showering myself, like, could this happen to me? Could this happen now? Um, never really asking a lot of questions about it, but it was sort of like a narrative that uh, went on in my head. And after that, I've since just taken baths and I almost feel like these funny aversions that we have in life, sometimes even they could be transgenerational. That's so interesting. I'm sure everyone is going to think about that tomorrow morning when they're taking their shower. Um, I am currently undergoing uh, a plumbing catastrophe at my house. Not even imagine, like this is not me catastrophizing. It is an actual catastrophe. So I can barely take a shower and definitely can't take a bath right now, which sort of explains why my hair does not is not at its best right now. I would I wouldn't have guessed, but uh... <laughs> very but, off topic comment but kind of related um it is sort of related i will i'm going to say that when something like that happens like the water main to my house broke and it's not covered by insurance it's going to cost a fortune and it's just been awful and there's water pouring out of my house um you know part of me is you know the the temptation is to go to that dark place only bad things happen to me. I have no one to protect me. It's all on me. And woe is me, which is not productive or healthy. And I will say that I have learned one thing I've learned. I've learned a lot writing this book, but one thing I learned going through the process was if my, if I inherited my parents' trauma, I also inherited their resilience and their strength because it took a lot of strength to come to Canada and move to a country where they didn't speak the language and have a family of three and buy a little house and start a little business. That took a lot of strength and resilience. And being aware of that, like having it presented to me as I sort of marinated in all of this over these years has really reminded me of that and has helped me um, uh, look, no one's going to compare a broken water main to Auschwitz, of course, but in day-to-day -day life, I believe that that can help me, not just hurt me, what I've inherited. For sure. And you talk about this somewhat in the book, and the research also points to this, which um, I've thought about updating my presentation to talk about more, um, the resiliency factor, right? Like, when you come from survivors, you're super tough. Like your blood is tough. Like you survive the worst possible thing. And so in addition to there being intergenerational trauma that impairs your psychological functioning, a lot of people try to also highlight that there's a certain resiliency that comes from coming from survivors, like a certain toughness. Um, and I think you see that, um, I'll only speak for Jewish people because that's what I know best, but I think you see that in the Jewish population, this toughness, um, like we kind of keep going. And that also comes from survivorship and not only surviving the Holocaust, but many, many generations of anti-Semitism, right? So there's this sort of strength too that I, I think is important to highlight. Yeah, and I'm really careful with this because you know, no one's going to say that my parents were more resilient or strong than the millions who didn't survive. That was luck and circumstance and all kinds of things that, you know, conspired to keep them alive and give me the miracle of life, um, which was deprived of so many people. I think about, and they did 
I will say they did, um, they did uh, show strength and resilience during the war, but lots of people did and it didn't help them in the end. But to me, the strength and resilience I really try to think about is that they kept going afterward because the enormity of the tragedy and the trauma that they experienced would, you know, I think it would level me. I don't know how people went on. I still don't know. And that to me is amazing. Well, I often think of Viktor Frankl and the idea of the sur people who survived having some kind of purpose. And yeah, I think that that's sort of beautiful too. The idea that they were living for something. There was like something that couldn't be taken away from them as part of this trauma that um, kind of fostered that resiliency. And it's something that I try to I bring up this book with my clients too. And I try to foster in my clients is this idea of finding that thing that makes it worth it to keep going. And I, I don't say this to clients, but even in the worst of circumstances, which our families both did because there was some reason to keep going. And so finding that in life too, like you can take that as a lesson as well is to try to find that thing that lights you up, that keeps you going, even when stuff gets hard. Right. Yeah. And the, the best is if you can find it inside of you. For my mother, that, and I, I call it her Y, uh, her W-H-Y, um, was her sister, Ella. Being reunited with her at Auschwitz is what became my mother's Y. And I'm sure that my mother was Ella's Y, and they kept each other alive because they had something to live for. And uh, yeah, Viktor Frankl writes about this, and it's, it is really powerful and amazing and you know, my, my son is my why, but there are many other things that are my, my why as well. My why's, sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure what the correct grammar is, but you, you know, when you live in a mindful way, which I try to do, there's a lot more opportunity to, to recognize all the why's that are all around us. Yeah. And I mean, like, it sounds like doing this work, like uncovering your family's legacy has served sort of as a why for you too. Absolutely. It, it, um, it was the hardest thing, but it was also, um, the most important thing. And it has brought me a lot of comfort and purpose, sense of purpose more than anything. Yeah. And how did you find the process of, you know, going to the Holocaust Museum? Because uh, you talk about this in the book and uncovering your parents' stories slowly, one document at a time, one coffee at a time, et cetera. So how did you sort of find that process? It was, um, it was amazing because I felt like I, I kind of felt like I was in a private eye, like, a, you know, a detective, and I was able to use, so I work as a journalist, as you mentioned, during my day job, and I was able to use those skills as a journalist to um, uncover as much as I could about my parents. And the, uh, you know, it was when I hit on something, when I learned something, it was absolutely uh, it was so exciting. So I, I went to the National Archives in the US in Maryland and went to the military archives and read through military reports around the time that my mother was liberated by the US soldiers. I was trying to find the group of soldiers who had liberated my mother. So in doing that, I was reading all these reports of these soldiers who were like trudging through Germany, going east toward Berlin. They'd come from France and they were liberating Germany along the way from the Nazis. And reading that stuff, like having the actual reports in my hand was a truly amazing experience, even if I never did get the name of a person who liberated my mother, unfortunately. But it was uh, it was a really exciting exercise. What do you think it would have meant to you to find the name of the liberators? Like, what would you have gotten from them? I wanted to say thank you. And I wanted to find, I mean, the liberators would not be alive. If they were, they would be very old. But I imagine, 
maybe they would have told their children about their war stories, about their experiences. Did they? Did they not? What did the kids hear? Did they hear about hundreds of women sitting in a meadow on the side of a road in Germany in a place called Kaunitz and no guards around and the U.S. soldiers did a U-turn and liberated them and gave them chocolate and um, had a Passover Seder with them. If, I don't know when, so at some point through the, that, I don't think it was that night, but in one of the days that followed, did those stories get passed down in their families? Um, that would be very interesting for me to have heard. There was some, there's something about, you know, it's not that I didn't believe my parents. Of course, I believed everything they told me, but there was something about going to the history books and reading about these hundreds of women liberated on April 1st, 1945 in Kaunitz, Germany, the story that I had grown up with, seeing it in the history books was amazing to me. It was, I, like I say, it's not that it made me believe my mother more. It just felt like my mother was part of something that was so big and so important. I don't think she thought of it that way. I don't think she thought of herself that way, um, but I do. Yeah, it sounds like it contextualized it for you in a way, like made you feel the gravity. But I remember when I was reading that in your book, my reaction, so I worked formerly, or my my, my last placement was with uh, the uh, police. So I was dealing with a lot of vicarious trauma with second responders sort of inadvertently. And one of the first thoughts that actually came to my mind was, it's kind of sad because the reverb of this trauma, those soldiers who came upon this too, they were probably, you know, experienced a little piece of that trauma as well that they took home to their families and had to heal from. And so not only did Hitler traumatize, you know, the Jews with his policies, but all of the people who had to witness these atrocities and not only the Germans, but also the people who were liberating and came upon these camps, like how were they after this, you know? And um, when reading your experience kind of looking for the liberators, this kept kind of popping into my mind. Like what was the effect on their families? And, you know, could their children be sitting here today having the same kind of discussion about, you know, when my dad came upon these 600 women, he was never the same afterwards. I, and I did read those stories. I read stories of um, American liberators. Uh, I think mostly Jewish Amer uh, liberators, who, uh, soldiers who liberated, none of them had liberated my mother, unfortunately, that's what I was looking for, but they had liberated people in, in camps or along other death marches, and it did a number on them. What they encountered, what they saw, I mean, the images are horrible. We're used to them, but imagine being like a 20-year-old American marching in to Bergen Belsen and seeing what they would have seen. It was traumatizing. And to go back to something you said earlier, one of the comments that really stayed with me was a soldier who said, I thought about it every time I took a shower. Every time I took a shower, I thought about it. So there it, it did, you know, resonate in that way. There are so many people who were traumatized. Listen, the descendants of the of the evildoers are also traumatized. They are also dealing with intergenerational trauma in a different way. So that's another thing. I mean, I touch on it briefly. Uh, don't I don't do a lot going into that um, area, but they too are are burdened with the um, with in, inherited uh, baggage. Yeah, and so I don't know, just the ripple effect of it all that somehow saddens me more because you know, it wasn't just us and our population, but now lots of different people who, because this person did something so terrible, now there's reverb in their families and it's just this whole network that you know came from one madman and his crazy theories. Yeah, and then it affects all the people we touch in our lives. And that's 
you know, yes, it goes on and on and on and on. It feels absolutely endless, but we're working to try to make it not endless. We're working to try to make, you know, not never to forget. Of course, we have, we always have to remember, but we don't have to suffer. We shouldn't have to suffer. Yes. Well, in fact, the forgetting, trying to forget or trying to ignore is not very helpful, right? It's uh, the opposite of healing. So talking about these memories, processing the emotions that are associated with them, and then integrating them into our overall being in a healthy way, not in a way where we're responding to triggers and they still feel like they're present for us. That's the healing journey, right? So I love the never forget idea, but I also like the idea of how do we heal? How do we fix it? How do we take away that, you know, emotion that impairs our functioning and how do we move towards post-traumatic growth? And that's specifically why I include stuff about post-traumatic growth in, um, in the uh, presentation, because I just want to move from being stuck in this um, trauma to growing from this trauma. It's not a life sentence. I mean, it, it is with us. There's no question. It will always affect me. It, I am who I am in large part because of it, but it doesn't mean I have to go through the world like a victim, which is what I had been doing and maybe am still doing a bit, but I'm working on it. I am a work in progress, as I like to say, but you know, the, on the never forget, if I can just add something, um, when we were growing up, we would hear never forget. And we would hear never again, which I still hear. And as a kid, when I heard never again, what that said to me was there was the potential for an again. And if there wasn't again, they'd be coming after me. And that, um, I think really re-traumatized me and not re-traumatized me, but it's, it scared the heck out of me. Um, I had, and still have, uh, dreams about hiding, Nazis coming to get me, being chased, uh, my parents being chased. Um, I, it's like historical, I'm in the war, or it's now, and the Nazis are here, or they're equivalent. And I think those dreams, those nightmares are pretty common from what and I hear. I find I have nightmares, not about Nazis specifically, but with similar themes. So I have a uh... A recurring, I used to have a recurring nightmare about somebody chasing me with acid to pour it on me, for example, or things like that, that feel like they're not mine because I don't know where they came from. And they almost feel like inherited trauma dreams or dreams of, I used to have this dream of hiding in a barn. Um, and I don't know where it came from. And so certain things like that, that feel like they're not my necessarily my own, but instead are part of my family legacy. And all of this has contributed to my, I described having issues as a baby sleeping that have, they've actually followed me throughout life. And sometimes those kinds of dreams can contribute to that uh, too. Um, yeah. So I, I also guess. was a baby who cried a lot, by the way, my yeah. mother all often told me. And I also have a very, um, I'm not a great sleeper. I can fall asleep, but I'll wake up many times. And it's often because of nightmares. Wow. I'm just, I sound like a very fun person. <laughs> I do trauma work all day long. So most people I know uh, avoid me, <laughs> but <laughs> Okay, so we have a couple of questions um, that some people wrote to me privately, some are starting to write publicly. If anybody has questions, wants to contribute comments, please put them in the chat. Um, but I'll read out a couple of them. Um, we only have 10 more minutes, so we might not have time for all. But one of um, the questions that was asked to me was about the title of the book, um, People Want to Learn More. Yeah, so this this is not going to be a satisfactory answer because I don't, I and I'm asked this every single interview I do, every event, kiss the red stairs. What does that mean? And I I'm not actually going to tell you only because if there's anyone here who is going to read the book, it is, um, it's a little gift to come upon that. I mean, not gift, but it's it. The reveal of it is, I think, a very emotional, uh, big moment in the book. And I don't want to take that away by describing it here. I will just say it has to do with going home, going home, going back to Poland. Interesting. I use my parents' word. My, my parents talked about home. 
they were talking about Poland. And I always found that very strange. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry that I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> I apologize. I had the same thought of like, I want people to uncover it because you learn about it in the book, right? Near the end. So um, sorry, please. buy the book. <laughs> My publicist would want me to say, buy the book, or you can take it out from the library. Uh, yeah, make your publicist happy. <laughs> um, okay, here's more of a comment, but I'll bring it up. Um, somebody wrote um, to me that it's really interesting to hear about the bath versus showers. Um, once when I was showering outside um, in the country in the U.S. on a beautiful sunny day, I had a really visceral response that I couldn't understand. And maybe it's connected to this. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, whether it's in our genes or it's in our heads, because we've we're we live around this. We've been grown, you know, we've been brought up into it, and it's all around us in our history. Of course, it's going to have an effect. Of course, how could it not? You know, I even wonder if it's like a uh, like a fear based memory that was transmitted because I from what I've read a lot of the gossiping in the or the, the conversation in the camps was like stay away from the showers the showers are the place that you shouldn't go so there must have been this I, I don't know obviously it wasn't there but there must have been this intense fear around the idea of going to get a shower and that kind of visceral fear to a stimulus like that like if the research continues to show that these kinds of fear-based memories can be inherited um, I could even see it being like an inherited memory that doesn't belong to you, if you know what I mean. Like, and then the yeah. stimulus starts in an environment that was similar to where your grandparent or parent might have been, and you have that same sort of reaction. So, wow, that's so interesting. Thank you to the person who shared that story. That's amazing. Um, okay, let me look what else people. Okay, a lot of people. I've been asking if we will share the link to the presentation. Yes, we will. Um, just to get that, because uh, I'm getting a bunch of messages about that. Um, okay, so um, another one is, I still have a fear of never again because of the rise of overt anti-Semitism in Canada. How do we deal with this increase? Oh, God, I wish I had the answer to that. It's really scary right now. It's really scary. I have to tell you, I, I just wrote about this today. The city of Vancouver has just adopted the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. I think that's what it's called, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And I listened to the debate last week, or I was monitoring it from home while I was doing some, you know, it was one of the things I was watching that day. And it was... Um, I use the word traumatizing uh, because it was listening to all of these stories, you know, a woman waking up to find a swastika drawn in the snow outside her home in Vancouver. Um, people, um, there's a group, including a rabbi and others, they call themselves the others. It's actually a fascinating group where they go and talk to students and they were talking to a school in Salmon Arm and some kids, high school students stood up and did the Hitler salute in the middle of their presentation. And a woman talk, a woman who owns a cafe here, an Israeli Canadian woman talked about being, you know, shouted out, out, out shouted at by um, anti-Israel demonstrators outside her cafe. And it was just story after story of this all day long. And I just felt sick. And then you see, you know, the Kanye stuff and the Kyrie stuff, Dave Chappelle and these tropes about Jews controlling Hollywood and having all the money and power. And you just like, I can't believe we're back here. I just can't believe we're back here. That this is considered at all acceptable that people are saying this and not being completely canceled off the earth. One thing I will say is by doing programs like this and focusing on healing and maybe reaching out to other groups outside of the Jewish community and trying to help them heal and find commonalities between our comments, like our stories, for example, like the Indigenous community, there's a lot of commonality between what has happened in the Indigenous community and what's happening, what has happened in the Jewish community. For example, 
concentration camps were originally called re-education camps, just like residential schools. There's a lot of conflict over land, whatever it is, I can go into my spiel, but I don't need to. So sometimes reaching out to these communities and offering healing and expressing stories and trying to create allyship in that way, I think can also be a very helpful way to start to combat anti-Semitism because if people are exposed to you and your stories and they start to feel like we're actually more similar than we are different, it's very hard to hate. Um, and so I think by, you know, trying to channel all this rage and hurt that people feel and people really feel hurt. Like I had a client tell me when they found out that I was doing this work, that they cry regularly about anti-Semitism because four, three of their four grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And, um, you know, this is a real, a very real thing for somebody. And if you can channel that hurt into healing and try to reach out to other communities and offer healing or at least allyship in their healing journey, um, I think that that can be a helpful way to start to redirect some of this anger and upset and hurt that we rightfully feel into something more productive that can maybe help the situation. Yeah, allyship is a real question because there's a, a feeling uh, among certain people in the Jewish community that we're kind of out here on our own and we're not being shown that allyship that I think we deserve. Um, but I do, I have a whole chapter in my book about Indigenous and uh, Jewish parallels and yeah. in dealing with inter intergenerational trauma. Because I don't think in this country we can talk about intergenerational trauma without talking about what has happened to Indigenous people here and the continuing reverberations of those horrors. For sure. Um, I couldn't agree more. And just the parallel, there's a lot of parallels, but we don't have to get, get too deep into that here today. Um, we have two more minutes. So we have a lot more questions here. Um, so Marsha, I don't know if you wanna stay a few more minutes and answer some more questions, or if we wanna just, um, end it here. I don't know if you have somewhere to be. I can answer more questions. I don't want to, I don't want to take up everyone's full night, but yes, I can, I can answer. I think it's going to be an order and dinner night over here. My Perfect. plans to make risotto are out the window. You're on another coast. So uh, I've already eaten dinner, so I'm good to go. But um, everybody, <laughs> obviously, of course, if you don't have time, drop off, but we can answer a few more questions. Maybe we can do 10 more minutes or so, um, and then uh, kind of cut it off there because it seems like more and more questions are piling up in the chat, which is great. I love the engagement, but yeah, I don't want to take up your, I don't want to keep you here till tomorrow. Um, I don't have much else to do, but yes, <laughs> don't want to keep, I'm sure other people do. Um, how do I help my 25 year old daughter who shows signs of intergenerational trauma? I'm a firstborn. Uh, I'm a first generation born to Holocaust survivors and I don't exhibit these signs or symptoms. So I would say um, if you want, you can reach out to me privately. I'll put my email in the chat uh, and I can connect you with some resources that might be helpful, but also having these conversations and sharing these stories, um, getting more involved in Holocaust education, um, these dialogues, talking directly about anti-Semitism, whatever it is that might be triggering um, your daughter. I would say um, these are ways to heal. Maybe even sharing the link, if mm -hmm. she can, to this program with her daughter. So here, I'll help. also put my email in the chat in case anyone needs it. Okay. While you're looking for a question, I'm just going to say behind me, I don't know if you can see because the lighting in this room is terrible, but there's a picture of my parents together. And next to them, the man with the mustache was my father's father. And I did not see a photo of him until I was in my 40s. Um, maybe, yeah, my late 40s. Uh, a researcher found it in Poland. So even though we had uncovered a few other photos, I've never seen a picture of my paternal grandmother, but I have pictures of my maternal grandparents and of one aunt who was murdered, but not none of my uncles. It is such a treasure though, to find a photo. 
uh, I do recommend if you can engaging a researcher who might be able to go through archives in your family's country of origin and see if they can find something. Yeah, you kind of, the book kind of inspired me around that actually, because we don't have a ton of knowledge about, um, my grandmother made tapes, but outside of that, we don't know that, or we, at least we don't talk about it too much in my family. So there are a lot of gaps. Um, and so uh, I like the idea of that or going to the archives or even going back to Lithuania, which, which is where my grandmother's from and I've never been, but yeah. I recommend it if you can. I mean, it's not for everyone. Some people absolutely do not want to go and I understand that too. Um, okay. So this I think is a great question. It's long, but I'll read it. It's um, from Andrea. And she said, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and being so real on, and honest about the impact it has had on you. I am a teacher and we are attempting to be the voice for your experiences within the school system. We want our kids to understand what happened, but it's very hard to, vo uh, to be the voice for an experience we have not been a part of. Some of these can be simple, such as swastika that can be sensationalized among our students. It always blows my mind. What is the best way to address this with kids six, seven, eight? I know it's a big question, but as the voice of the community, what would you want us to say? Um, I gasp and tell the kids not to ever show, display, or draw um, art that sim uh, that's symbolizes Hitler because Hitler was a horrible human, uh, but this always brings up so many more questions than answers. Oh my gosh. My son's school has been uh, dealing with this. There was um, last year, so he's in grade nine now. When he was in grade eight, there was he was passed an eraser and there was a swastika drawn on it. And then there has been all kinds of swastika graffiti in the bathrooms. And this is an ongoing issue. And I asked if I could speak to the school. Um, which they brought me in. I was part of a, like an anti-racist assembly. I don't think I was able to really get my point across, but I think if that is happening in your school, contact the local Holocaust Education Center and have them organize a visit with a survivor or you know, I know there are fewer and fewer survivors. I don't know if there are children of survivors who do these talks, but every Holocaust education center can connect you with a survivor or someone to speak to the kids and they know how to talk to them. They know how to get to their level. And my feeling is, although, you know, I'm not the expert, but my feeling is that these kids are doing something to shock and they don't really understand the consequences. Um, of what that swastika represents. And if they did, if they met someone who had been living in a concentration camp or whose parents were killed in a gas chamber, I think that they would, um, I hope that they would think twice. And um, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center also does this work. So you can contact them directly and it should be, um, I highly, highly recommend connecting with your local education center or Simon Wiesenthal Center. Get someone in to talk to the kids. That is the best way to deal with it, in my opinion. And if you want to tackle it from an intergenerational trauma lens, uh, Jax has a high school program uh, where we come to high schools and we talk, uh, high schools and grade schools, and we talk about uh, mental health and how to manage your mental health and all of that. And we can provide programming uh, similar to this. Um, yeah, for your class, if it's something that you're interested in. It's like another option. The more you know, the better. Information is power. And that's how I felt, you know, writing this book, I came across a lot of horrific information, but it helped inform me, pardon the use of that word, uh, and uh, guide me in my own journey and healing, even the horrific stuff. Okay. So Lior has told me this is our last question. She's cutting us off. So um, this is from Doris and she says, great presentation. Thanks for sharing your experiences. Why do you think some of the children of survivors have intergenerational trauma, but others don't? Gosh, I wish I had the answer to that, but you know, every, every household was different. Um, 
even every experience of a child is different. So your name is Doris. One of my sisters, her name is Doris. And she, uh, both of my sisters were incredibly, they were instrumental and irreplaceably helpful in writing this book. But one thing they've told me, and specifically my sister Doris, is that her experience of my family and our childhoods was completely different from mine. She had a, a different kind of takeaway. So, you know, we're all individuals. We might be affected in different ways as individuals and different survivors were affected on different levels and have dealt with it differently. I mean, that's my not expert answer. That's my answer as someone who, you know, has seen it even in my own household that my sister's were affected differently than I was. And I will say, um, you know, the research hasn't fully confirmed this yet. And a lot of it is still going on to try to figure out exactly what your question is. So it's a great question. But one thing that um, is sort of accepted, at least, is the idea that environmental stressors help to trigger the epigenetic markers that sit on top of our genes. So some of us may have experienced environmental stressors tr uh, too that triggered that intergenerational trauma, while other people may not have experienced um, that same level of environmental stressors. So for example, Marsha, if you hadn't gone through a divorce, you may not have experienced the intergenerational trauma to the same depth as if you had. For me, I was bullied a lot when I was a kid and that interpersonal trauma, I think, triggered my intergenerational trauma. So if you haven't had the major triggers in your life, so some kind of interpersonal issue or whatever it may be, you may have those epigenetic markers, but they may never actually act on you and be expressed. So also it depends on the environment that you grow up in and um, the kinds of things that happen in your life. Um, yeah. And it also might depend on birth order and gender. Both of those things are being looked at um, as potential moderators for intergenerational trauma. So basically the answer, as far as I know it from the research is it's complicated, but <laughs> there are some potential things that may differentiate. Yeah, I am I was last in the birth order and by quite a stretch. And I think that my parents being younger and having more energy, and I think they were more engaged maybe with my other sisters, which is why they're not as crazy as I am. I don't know. I'm not crazy. I just, you know, I'm interesting. I'm complicated, as you would say, Jenna. Uh, yeah, I would say, I would say interesting. I like interesting. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for this um, very engaging and informative and very powerful conversation. I think um, a lot of amazing um, information was shared. And I just want to thank you both for sharing your experiences. Um, on behalf of Friends Time and Wiesenthal Center, we wanted to thank you both for joining us. Um, this is our second time doing um, this topic with Jax. And um, I think it's just getting even more powerful. So thank you so much, Jenna, again. Um, and thank you, Marsha, for joining us. Um, Jenna's emails in the chat, um, if you have any more questions for Jenna. Um, and the recording will be sent out either tomorrow or the next day. Um, if you have any other questions about what Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center does, I put my email in the chat as well, and I can connect you with the appropriate um, person based on your question. Um, so thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, the rest of your day, um, and have a great night. Thanks, thank everyone. You so much. Bye. See you.